Warm welcome to the international seminar titled Contemporary West Asia and the Great Powers of the Crossroads, organized by Tulusama Foundation. I'm Tom Das, Director of Tulusama Foundation. Tulusama Foundation is a global organization working in the areas of international relations, financial, environmental, scientific, strategic, and defense policy. We are going to have a very interesting discussion today on the emerging dimensions of diplomacy, regional geopolitics, and security competition in West Asia. On this international seminar titled Contemporary West Asia and the Great Powers at the Crossroads. The distinguished speakers at this seminar are His Excellency Dr. Riyadh Abbas, Ambassador of the Syrian Arab Republic to India, Ambassador M. K. Bhadrakumar, former Indian Ambassador to Turkey and Uzbekistan, political analyst and strategic thinker. Professor A. K. Pasha, Professor and Director, Gulf Studies Program, Center for West Asian Studies, JNU. Ms. Seema Mustafa, Senior Journalist and Editor-in-Chief, The Citizen. Mr. Atul Aneja, international journalist and editor, India Narrative. The discussion will be moderated by Dr. Wai Lawaz, distinguished advisor of West Asia, Tulusama Foundation. I must especially thank His Excellency Dr. Riyadh Abbas for being here with us. Let me now request Dr. Awaz to take the discussion forward. Thank you, Soham. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see every uh, a very distinguished guest on the panel, and I am sure we will have a very fruitful discussion. Uh, the topic is quite interesting, not only for the uh, for us, but also for the rest of the world. And who can be better to people to speak on this except the the distinguished and the caliber thinking think tanks, think tank, and thinkers who have been already involved in this region? Either they have lived in that in this region, or they have been writing extensively and uh, thoroughly and comprehensively on the issue. So I think we are going to have a very fruitful discussion. And I'm going to give a 10 minutes to each one of the speakers to speak on the contemporary issues and what could be. Uh, I would like some of you to focus also on the uh, rule of India, because I wanted to see the uh, West Asian affairs from the prism of India, not from the prism of the great powers where they are dividing on the colonial attitude. So I think we can, uh, without further delay, I would invite our Excellency, Dr. Riyad Abbas, who has been very acquainted with the Indian uh, diaspora, with Indian, uh, I'm uh, living in India for more than two decades now, and he's been involved with the uh, developing a good relation between Syria and India. Not only that, Syrian, we choose Syria this time because uh, Syria is considered to be the changing paradigm of the uh, future of Middle East and the West Asia, or West Asia as India call it, because we know that there are lots of development will take place out of the war on Syria and the outcome of this war. So, Excellency Dr. Yad Abbas. Uh, good morning, my friend. Uh, thank you, Dr. Awad, to allow me to join this uh, meeting. Uh, my friend, I know that. You are all experts in the political history of the Middle East, especially Syria, which was called the Greater Syria, before it was divided at the beginning of the 20th century by the colonial countries into four countries, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Palestine. The conflict in Syria began in the region after the announcement of Belfort Declaration and the establishment of the Israel on Palestine. In fact, the reality tells that the world's superpower and even the United Nations have not been able to find a just and comprehensive solution to the conflict in the Middle East between the Arabs and Israel. Under the sponsorship of America in 2011, the wave of the Islamic Spring began to strike the Arab countries headed by the Muslim Brotherhood Party. The president of Libya and the president of Yemen were killed because of its effect. Then intentionally spreading chaos on the Arab lands in order to reach what we saw today just to serve the agreement of the century. Syria refused with its allies, refused the normalization with Israel because of the president's refusal, refusal to implement the American policy in the region. The major conspiracy against Syria went into 
action to uh, overthrow the legal government of or changing its policy for two main goals. Passing Qatari gas pipeline to Europe, signing a peace agreement with Israel without returning to the Syrian and Palestinian rights. The direct cause for the Syrian crisis was the president's rejection of Erdogan's request to include the Muslim Brotherhood Party in the power in Syria. Also, rejection of Hamad bin Khalifa, the former Emir of Qatar, request to assist Hariri's return to the power in Lebanon. Under silly pretext, an America lead an army of mercenaries to destroy Syria after arming and training them in Turkey. Those mercenaries were financed, financed by the Gulf country who called for jihad in Syria under the pretext of established on an Islamic caliphate in Syria. This event by itself would destroy the reputation of Islam. Some Arab countries were involved in destroying Syria. The Syrian crisis was transfer transferred from the Arab League, which has not achieved anything for Arab since its establishment, to the United Nations. The suffering of the Syrian were done directly by the Americans. Before the American intervention, the Syrian economy was solid. Most of the Syrian product, its industrial goods, fuel, and agricultural products are made locally. Moreover, Syria was one of the safest countries in the world. In 2006, the American embassy in Damascus entered into active plan to destabilize and destroy Syria. And in 2011, the United Nations of America sent a special secret CIA team to Syria to train and, and equip the uh, leadership of uh, anti-agreement terrorists. And former U.S. President Barack Obama stated that they had provided them with everything they needed. NATO and America had launched a false propaganda campaign against Syria since the beginning of the events and against the President Assad. They accused it of using the sarin gas attacks that killed civilians. No reporter, however, has asked why Assad is using gas against children and not using it against the terrorist armies who are attacking his capital, Damascus. The reason is clear, no comment. In 2018, US Defense Secretary Jim Mattis admitted that we have no evidence that Assad used sarin gas. Two members of the Turkish parliament were accused of treachery because they discovered how an Al-Qaeda cell had infiltrated. Here we are should ask why Syria is being attacked. There are a number of uh, reasons, part of them are related to US foreign policy, which seeks to control oil and gas pipeline and gas sources, which will serve Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia want to impose Wahhabi Islam, which is rejected by the Syrian who are religiously tolerant. The Turkish wanted to steal the industrial city of Aleppo and bought the Syrian oil and Syrian agricultural products. After America failed in its project and after its army of mercenaries was totally defeated, it 
illegally invaded Syria in 2015 and seized Syrian oil to heighten the uh, series on the Syrian people. Secretary, Secretary Mike Pompeo was boasting the suffering and the this of the Syrians by, say, by saying, we cut off the sources of currency and bend Iranian oil tanker heading on Syria under the pretext of targeting the Syrian leaders. In fact, those sanctions did nothing but targeting the old and the innocent Syrian people. America has tightened its block, block, it, block it on Syria by blocking the supply needed for reconstruction. So young Syrians are forced to choose between fighting as a mercenary, a mercenary for providing food to their family or facing hunger. My friend, after 10 years of war that we are forced to this war that is starving our own people. We want to rebuild our country and return the people to their homes. America, however, is still blocking all the material necessary or needed for reconstruction. Please advise us of your solution. My friend, only India, it was in favor of Syria since the beginning of our crisis. India always sent uh, help for our people, sent aid, medicine, give scholarship for our students, and always uh, announce for no external intervention in Syria and to find the uh, political solution by Syrians themselves. That is India. We highly appreciate the uh, stand of India. And we need from your side, our friend, what is your idea, how we can solve our problem in Syria, how we can defeat all those uh, foreigners who occupied our land and uh, make our uh, people starving uh, for, uh, on this uh, crisis. Thank you, my friend. Thank you very much, Excellency. I'm happy that you were on time. Picture. I would like to invite Ambassador Bhadra Kumar Milkonangara, who is a very uh, well-known person on the region, I have served as an Indian ambassador also to Russia, to uh, Turkey, and he is a very uh, veteran writer, and we have enjoyed his writing, and he's well-known in the Arab world and in West Asian affairs. Ambassador, please feel free to speak, and the floor is yours. Well, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, firstly, let me uh, mention that uh, this is my first uh, happy association with uh, Philotoma Foundation. I went through the website. It's a very interesting, exciting enterprise, which is, uh, I hope, uh, going to tread a, an entirely new path in the culture of think tanks operating in our country. I wish the organization all the best. And let me therefore uh, offer a word of uh, gratitude to my old friend, Pail, to facilitate this uh, association with uh, the Lothama Foundation. I'm very happy to reconnect with a lot of old friends because I'm based in uh, Tirvanandapuram, in a far corner of India at the moment. Uh, how do I start and how do I proceed over 10 minutes to sum up the West Asian situation? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a period of great volatility, a period of uh, transition and uh, arresting time. And uh, looking ahead and uh, making prophecies is uh, very risky, very adventurous, it will be very illogical. Uh, frankly, as I see it, one of the subplots of the West Asian situation is uh, stealthily moving in to the center stage as probably the main plot for decades to come, which is uh, that the Iranian revolution after 42 years is uh, inching close to 
realizing its uh, objectives in terms of the moorings of the revolution. The surge of Iran and uh, its uh, realization of its full potentials as a, as a regional power. And that is going to have a phenomenal impact on the correlation of forces in West Asia. We'll have to wait and see what is the time frame in which this is happening. I see an inevitability about it. And uh, then thereafter, we have to see how the uh, international environment, the international community gets uh, accustomed to it. But firstly, let me say on this uh, specific topic of the great powers, great power struggle in the West Asian uh, scene, this is not something new. Uh, in a way, you could even uh, trace it back to the Crusades. But uh, certainly in uh, modern history, uh, we need to go back to the arrival of uh, Napoleon in Alexandria on the 1st of uh, July, 1798, as probably a good uh, benchmark. And at that time for uh, undertaking this campaign to the uh, West Asian uh, region, Napoleon had uh, sent a, given a memorandum to the so-called directory at that time, which uh, took over from the revolutionaries in uh, Paris, uh, where he detailed the objectives of his mission. I'm mentioning this to make a point that the, uh, the, the uh, dynamics of the Middle East vestation situation and the main templates of the great power struggle have remained more or less the same through the last couple of centuries. That's the point I'm making. So Napoleon said, uh, securing advancing French uh, commercial interests, uh, competing with the uh, British access route to India and East Asia, and specifically to align with Tipu Sultan for the eviction of uh, uh, Britain from the Indian subcontinent. Uh, in, a, uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in an aside, he also brought in the aspect of uh, a cultural mission. As you know, he left a profound impact on uh, Egypt's uh, evolution as a modern state uh, in terms of uh, drafting a constitution, in terms of uh, bringing in uh, certain values of the enlightenment, the revolution, and so on. But anyway, so uh, these uh, trends are uh, more or less continuing. There is a, there is on the one hand, there is a, uh, there is a struggle for uh, the domination, control and domination of the region, uh, political, economic, and uh, cultural domination. Uh, there is a uh, geopolitical struggle amongst the various protagonists for gaining the upper hand. And there is an external dimension to it that is in terms of uh, the uh, region, the far beyond, uh, uh, mm -hmm. the forces which are working there, they get reflected there. And let me say at this point, one other aspect, which I think is important that even today, uh, it is going to be in West Asia that I think the evolution of the world order is uh, finally going to be determined. It's not going to be in uh, Southeast Asia or Indian Ocean, and they are all actually appendages of it, but the main uh, struggle and the main and the outcome in West Asia is going to be very decisive for the course of uh, world politics through the rest of the century. Anyway, after Napoleon, when we come to the next stage is the uh, disintegration of the Ottoman Empire and the struggle that ensued uh, between Britain and France for the Middle East settlement. And that was followed by uh, the uh, discovery of oil, uh, the Middle East settlement discovery, which is a very momentous period in the last century, the, uh, there about the second decade of the last century and the early part of the third uh, the decade and the third, early part of the third decade. Uh, oil, uh, Bolshevik revolution, um, oil, Bolshevik revolution, uh, collapse of the Ottoman Empire. So with this, you know, there was a struggle again, a, the, 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 like in a kaleidoscope, the whole pieces started, you know, moving 
and a new kind of a pattern was setting in, which uh, found its reflection in this famous six people pact, carving out the situation, situation, you know, in terms of French and British interests. Bolsheviks, Russians withdrew. Then the Russians came back to the region later. And uh, it, during the Cold War, it then took an entirely different uh, turn in terms of West versus USSR. That was through the Cold War period. After the end of the Cold War, uh, we have today uh, two things which are uh, in evidence. One is the resurgence of uh, Russia uh, after the post-Soviet Russia. And uh, the second is uh, the arrival of uh, an entirely new player on the horizon, that is China. Uh, China is not new to, West Asia is not new to China. China is not new to West Asia. But uh, uh, this sort of an arrival uh, in with uh, geopolitics and uh, with uh, a search for getting a habitation and a name in the region, uh, and which is integral to China's own development and so on. These are all new uh, tendencies there. So China is uh, coming in as a major player and it is setting its uh, uh, pieces there. It has its concepts of uh, time and space. So it is taking time over it. Uh, well, you must tell me, you know, that if I'm uh, getting short of time. Eh? Uh, but the, uh, uh, so in the present situation here now, we have on the one hand, the United States with uh, a, a diminished and diminishing influence in the region, not only in the region, but globally, which has been in evidence, uh, you know, though it was uh, in the unipolar predicament, it got unnoticed for much of the Cold War, post-Cold War period, but it is very much in evidence now. So that one. Russia's resurgence and China's arrival. And uh, I see a, a kind of a rudiments. It's, I, don't, I don't predict that it is going to be an enduring phenomenon, but uh, there is a certain proximity between Russia and China uh, today in pushing back at the US. And that is, uh, in the short term at least, that is going to get reflected in the West Asian situation. As I said, I do not uh, claim that it is going to be an enduring phenomenon because as history has shown that uh, these uh, alignments keep changing in terms of uh, um, new factors of advantage for each of the protagonists. But at the moment you can see it in evidence and therefore the advantage is uh, likely to go to this uh, Russian Chinese axis as time passes. But uh, I don't see the United States uh, um, easily giving in there. As the ambassador said, uh, the uh, struggle that is there in uh, Syria shows very well that uh, uh, not only in uh, Syria, but also in Yemen, the American intervention has been fairly extensive. Though they all, uh, you know, the Western powers all mention Iran as the main culprit. You know, Iran didn't start any of these things. They were all started more or less by the United States and its uh, regional allies, whether it is uh, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Libya, all these theaters. So you see the United States, I don't think is going to uh, withdraw, retrench from the region. There is a facile assumption that uh, since the United States is now an exporter of oil, it really has no requirement to have a presence in the Middle East. It is no minute, Ambassador, please. Sorry. One minute. Okay. It is, uh, it is uh, uh, therefore, you know, that kind of a compulsion is not working the, on the American strategy. But that's not entirely true. In fact, the main uh, source of interest to the Americans in the West Asian situation is about the petrodollar. And in terms of the petrodollar, so long as, uh, you know, the Americans uh, benefit out of uh, dollar being a world currency. Now, this is where the Chinese thing, I will briefly mention, I, we can develop it in the subsequent discussion. This is where the Chinese presence is going to be very, very crucial because China is going to challenge the uh, dollar's uh, preeminence as the world currency. Uh, it will not be confrontational, but it will be incremental. And that is uh, going to uh, 
find its reflection in the Western politics as now the pact that has been talked about with uh, Iran, there is sufficient evidence that they may trade in local currency, the payment system. Now, if that happens, uh, China is already um, experimenting with digital currency with the UAE. And if uh, Saudi Arabia also switches towards that and with these tensions in the relationship between Saudi Arabia and the US, you cannot entirely rule out. And if you know local currency payment systems evolve, then petrodollar comes uh, in as a very major factor and uh, there is going to be all sorts of big possibilities. I leave it at that abruptly and I can revisit some of this depending on the discussions later. Thank you very much, Vail. Thank you, Ambassador. Very nice discussion, and I'm happy you brought the issues of the entry of China, and I think that will add more to the discussion on the topic. I'd like to, to invite uh, Professor A.K. Pasha, now associated with West Asia for ages, and he has served in the region in Cairo, and he has also been the director of the uh, uh, West Asian uh, the studies in the Jawaharlal Nehru University. Professor Pasha, the floor is yours. After two diplomats, we want an academician who can fill up the gap where the ambassadors are shy to, to speak on those issues. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wailawad, uh, for giving me this opportunity to share my views. Uh, I'm going to start uh, my presentation, brief presentation in the 10 minutes I have. Uh, flagging off from the end of the Second World War, the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, the emergence of Jamal Abdel Nasser after the revolution in Egypt, the struggle uh, for uh, uh, dominance or influence in this region uh, started in a big way. And from early 50s, we see two competing orders uh, uh, trying to establish uh, dominance in this. Uh, the UK, US, uh, Israeli-led uh, order began taking shape with the Baghdad Pact, uh, later on Cento, uh, so on and so forth. And the Nasser-led uh, uh, Arab order through Arab League and the Republican order spread across uh, from Egypt to Syria, to Iraq, to Yemen and subsequently to Libya, Sudan, etc. But uh, this uh, struggle uh, went in favor of the West after the Israelis won the 1967 war uh, in which uh, uh, Nasser and Arab nationalism were uh, subdued for uh, some time. The 1973 war was another turning point uh, in the region's order uh, because uh, then uh, Anwar Sadat uh, abandoned the Soviet Union and opted for uh, an alliance with the United States, which ultimately uh, paved the way for uh, the American-led order, uh, which still uh, in one shape or the other continues. But it is not uh, without any challenge. The Iranian revolution in 1979 uh, has been continuously uh, working for a regional order, although under its leadership, not under Egypt. But uh, it has uh, other uh, supporters uh, in the region after changes in Yemen, in uh, yeah, Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, and uh, after the Arab Spring uh, in all of these countries from Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, uh, Sudan, and Bahrain, and Oman, and uh, Yemen, so on and so forth. So this uh, struggle uh, for the last uh, 50 years or so has been continuous and which has seen uh, foreign interventions, revolutions, civil wars, border wars, uh, uh, in other words, uh, destruction, displacement, refugees, uh, pain, agony, uh, including the invasions of uh, US invasion of Iraq and the civil war uh, triggered by regional and international powers in Syria, and of course the Yemeni uh, civil war, not to speak of Somalia, Libya, and uh, other countries. So the regional powers, uh, uh, in one way or the other, have been resisting the Western-led uh, uh, order, which is basically in favor of Israel, in favor of exploitation of oil and the related commerce, and the control over the strategic uh, heartland of uh, this uh, area in order to contain uh, the earlier uh, former Soviet Union and now uh, China. 
so uh, the, the 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 misery the pain the old order uh, stands virtually discredited uh, uh, not only by the people in large numbers uh, from morocco to afghanistan and from turkey to sudan somalia but also many of the rulers who were thought to be friendly to the west uh, they are also developing are developing cold feet whether it is erdogan of turkey or mbs of uh, Saudi Arabia or even uh, Abdul Fattah Sisi of uh, Egypt, not to speak of other smaller states, they are not sure if uh, they will get the support from the West to remain in power, uh, largely in defiance of their own uh, people, uh, because uh, uh, the democratic structures are weak in these countries. Uh, so uh, the new order uh, led by uh, Iran, and its allies is supported solidly by China and Russia, as uh, highlighted by Amb Ambassador Bhadra Kumar. The new regional player is uh, Turkey. Also, he is uh, aligned with Russia, China, Iran, and uh, its own allies, whether it is Qatar or Libya or now uh, Yemen, where it is taking uh, growing interest. The other uh, uh, major power, regional power in the proximity is, of course, India. Although not at a great power, but uh, it is aiming to become one in the near uh, future. So you have India, UAE, Israel, and the United States uh, in favor of the old order, in favor of the status quo. And uh, the other group led by Iran, uh, Turkey, supported by Russia, China, and of course, a uh, large number of people, whether it is in Lebanon or Syria or Iraq or Bahrain or uh, Libya, Egypt and other countries, uh, the masses uh, are in favor of a regional order which sees reconstruction, uh, redevelopment, uh, democracy, uh, peace, security and stability. That is what uh, the regional order has been aspiring uh, for. And more importantly, uh, to have a regional architecture, uh, architecture in which the regional players will have deciding role and not the external powers uh, uh, who have entrenched uh, themselves. So the, 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 the positive development growing from the Syrian, Syrian civil war, where the agenda was to overthrow the regime of uh, Bashar al-Assad, uh, which was throttled by Russia, Iran, support from Hezbollah, uh, uh, and uh, it, uh, it has been largely defeated uh, by, led by the United States, Israel, EU, GCC countries, uh, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, the Israeli attempt uh, supported by the United States to dominate and remain the sole major power uh, in this region has been frustrated. And that is linked uh, to the gradual decline of the United States uh, 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 interest uh, after its defeat in uh, Iraq or uh, its inability for regime change in Syria or its defeat in Somalia or Iraq or Yemen or Libya, so on and so forth. So the UK-US led uh, order is on the decline and uh, gradually, in my view, the regional order, order uh, is beginning to take shape because uh, uh, as I said, the people by and large are frustrated with all of these destruction wars and foreign interventions which they have seen both in the regional uh, aspiring countries and also the Western backed uh, uh, countries. If you take the public opinion in Egypt or Saudi Arabia or even in Oman or Kuwait uh, or uh, uh, other pro Western countries like Jordan or Morocco, etc. So the people, as reflected in the Arab Spring, are uh, earning, earning for uh, uh, the principles uh, of justice, uh, including the Palestinians, uh, where they feel that uh, their destiny should be decided by themselves and not uh, manipulated by external powers through a king or a ruler, uh, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, China, of course, uh, through its massive oil purchases, uh, has become a major uh, player. But what is interesting is uh, its Belt and Road Initiative has linked almost all countries uh, in this uh, region, from Afghanistan to Iran, Turkey, Iraq, uh, 
Syria and uh, other countries through maritime or the land route. Uh, China is slowly but steadily increasing its clouds and its influence, uh, both economic, political, diplomatic, and also gradually by selling weapons and arms. Uh, it is positioning itself uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a quiet but firm manner. And this is reflected in the uh, diplomatic visits by Chinese leaders, especially the foreign minister, which he had recently across the board, whether it is short visit of Oman or the lengthy visit in Iran or Turkey or uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and his earlier forays in Egypt, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there is this uh, uh, realization among the West Asian countries uh, that China doesn't have the past uh, imperial background which America or the European countries have. So uh, China is going to play a major role and uh, in this, uh, unfortunately, India, instead of positioning itself as a major player in this uh, region, is sidelining itself, uh, confining its relations with UAE, Israel, uh, and uh, with the status quo agenda against China through the Quad with the United States, Japan, and uh, Australia. So in the nutshell, uh, what I'm trying to highlight is uh, uh, this 30 to 50 years of struggle has seen uh, both the people and the leaders are getting frustrated uh, uh, with the United States-led order because it has uh, always favored the Israeli point of view. And Israel uh, has aspired to be the sole dominant power, uh, which is now being questioned or challenged through China, through Russia, uh, through Iran. Uh, and uh, in the new dynamics is the people. People are also increasingly getting frustrated with the Western-led order because it has not them the, brought them the fruits they were uh, aspiring. So uh, I think uh, India, uh, uh, as a regional power, uh, uh, has to calculate carefully uh, where its interests are, whether it is energy security or workers or trade or investments. Uh, we cannot afford to put uh, all our eggs in uh, one basket, uh, uh, which is uh, very risky. Uh, phenomenon in this kind of uh, region, which is full of minefields, which is full of flashpoints, uh, where, is, where there is polarization, uh, increasing polarization in this uh, region. But ultimately, I think it is the people uh, who are now giving shape to their rulers, whether it is uh, uh, the monarchies or military-led regimes or uh, countries like Iran or Turkey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. We're on time, and uh, I know we we love to listen to your uh, in-depth analysis always. And I'm sure that you can add more with the question and answer session. Let me invite uh, my old colleague and my dear friend Seema Mustafa. Seema has been associated also with our region. She traveled to the region. She has been uh, covering it, and she's now the chief editor of the Citizen. She's a writer and a veteran journalist. Seema, please add your input and valuable opinion to our discussion, and let's move forward with your uh, uh, great analysis. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for this invitation, and, um, and I really have to thank uh, you, Dr. Vaad, and the Lothama Foundation, mainly because it has forced me, uh, or actually it has acted as a nudge to get back to the region I used to write a lot about, but have neglected in recent years uh, or recent months. Uh, though we've been following it, but not writing about it. So this has been like a wake up call. And while uh, going through some of the material on what is happening in West Asia, uh, uh, one realized and one remembered all our visits there and the kind of um, warmth from the people of all the countries that have often been called uncivilized in the Western media, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Lebanon, you know, it's uh, Palestine, uh, amazing people. And uh, it is extremely tragic that they continue to suffer because of bad rulers, uh, bad governments at some point, and of course the geopolitical plan for that region, starting with the oil. Now, it has been decades of violence and strife for all the people and the countries of West Asia. 
And even now, I think the first action of the Biden administration that came to power with so much of um, talk of democracy was to bomb Syria, a sort of a reminder that they exist. Of course, this time I feel that it was more a desperate act of a falling power and a more of a I am here message than uh, more. But even so, it was, it sort of underlined the kind of plans that the American administration continues to have and has had for this region. Uh, I think uh, we are looking now at what could be possibly a major shift. And I'm, I'm really flagging issues as a journalist, uh, which does not mean that I'm bringing great uh, analysis to it, but just flagging what one can see uh, happening in the region and in the countries altogether. And the Americans, I, to some extent, have painted themselves out of the region. Uh, mainly because of their wars, the inability to, which we've always spoken of, their inability to understand the sensitivities and the concerns of the people, uh, their whole intention of coming in from the top uh, to shock and awe, the whole embedded media that they brought along in their wake and their entry into Iraq, which has continuously manipulated the news emerging and the sensitivities of the people. And then when you don't have the correct information Obviously, you're not able to do a course correction of any kind in terms of what the Americans want in that region. So in the intervening years, of course, and over the decades too, Russia has always been interested and it has now consolidated itself further in the region through what is a calculated and, of course, calibrated strategy entering the West Asian um, uh, scenario through Syria by standing with the Assad regime and by making it very clear that uh, it is um, there for good and it is not going to uh, tolerate this kind of American intervention, um, you know, which has earned, earned it goodwill in Syria, which is an important player and remains an important player in the region. But the new kid on the black block is China. And I think that is very interesting as to what Ch the China is now doing in West Asia, partly through its, mostly through its Belt and Road Initiative, but also, of course, it's uh, all the trade and uh, investment that uh, surrounds it and showing a very clear strategic interest as it expands its footprint in West Asia. The, uh, the recent tour of their foreign minister, the Six Nation tour itself, has elicited interest, many columns, many articles. And it, is, it, is, it starts with this pact with Iran. And when you have a pact with Iran, you you define a certain geopolitical state, uh, space in West Asia and where you are standing today. And, um, and it has moved in where the Americans moved out uh, after entering the, uh, the, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action in 2015. In 2018, Trump pulled out of that and left that space uh, um, despite European advice and he's left that space for others to come in. China, of course, now has a presence in most parts of Iran, and including the very strategic Straits of Hormuz. And it is um, through its Belt and Road Initiative it, uh, and the visit of its foreign minister, it has established and very conclusively its interest in West Asia. Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Iran, UAE, Bahrain, Oman was the basket that he visited. And that itself, if you know the region, gives you an indication of what the geopolitical interests of China are. And the Belt and Road Initiative has already brought in Iraq, Lebanon, Qatar, Yemen uh, uh, into its own, uh, into its fold. Lebanon itself, which is always, which has been feeling a little isolated, has reached out to the Chinese. And the Chinese have come in saying that they will support its power sector. And uh, it is going to set, uh, they're going to set up power stations. They are going to uh, construct a tunnel to connect Beirut to the Beka Valley, et cetera, et cetera. This is just an indication of the kind of spread that the Chinese have uh, envisaged for West Asia. Uh, in, interestingly, during this time, uh, and also, I mean, uh, UAE, Saudi Arabia, it has a strategic partnership with both. So it's not playing any favorites, it's playing them all. And UAE has come out in support 
of its um, of china's position against its muslim uh, minority so it has managed to elicit that support as well at the same time while um, america has uh, has taken a very uh, under trump particularly a very strong stand for israel and stop you know that even the pretense of balancing the palestinian issue with israel uh, uh, Amer uh, russia and china continue to do that maybe it's just lip service because both have good relations with israel as well but both have continue to talk about a just solution and about a solution to that uh, uh, to the palestinian issue um russia has also opened channels with libya it has uh, tied up with the national oil corporation it has positioned itself uh, in syria uh, it has um, uh, so there is this big spread of interest even as the americans now under the biden administration uh, seem to be panicking and looking at what they can do to get back so now there is talk of going back into the pact with iran there is also talk of ending support to saudi arabia's attack on yemen a vicious vicious war that saudi arabia carried out on the yemenis um and uh, we i'm sure that in the coming days and weeks we are going to see and hear more from the biden administration in so far as the region is concerned and what it can do to regain the foothold that it seems to have lost um i'm just going to uh, sort of end this and leave it to questions but i do want to say that i think the chinese strategy um and uh, russia you know there have been a lot of american uh, think tanks which i could see who have been writing whether there will be a conflict between russia and china on west asia and fact that both of them are entering and just now a little earlier i think this question was answered in a way by ambassador bhadra kumar who sent uh, and who keeps alerting us to some of the major developments in the region and outside on, on foreign policy on the joint statement of russia and china on the global governance and uh, where they have uh, made it very clear that they're working together that they have uh, uh, they are uh, it's like a warning to the americans that interference in the internal affairs of sovereign states under the pretext of promoting democracy is unacceptable and um, uh, in that sense for the moment still this kind of um, uh, speculation that there could be problems between them as both are set to expand their um, their footprint across the world so i'm going to leave it at this and if there are questions thank you thank you thank you very much sima you have added your uh, uh, very valuable points and inputs in this discussion and i am very happy that the citizen have started as an international and a regional um news uh, news uh, magazines or a uh, website as we say but now you have to come back into the uh, region because you have lots of things to tell the world also and especially india i have finally in our list of the panelists distinguished panelists is our friend and my dear friend uh, atul anija and the good part of it that i uh, being staying in india for so long that you are always associated with friends and uh, the best part that i continue this relation with atul when he was posted in bahrain when he was posted in in china as the correspondent of uh, the hindu now he is becoming uh, the editor of the uh, narrative india narrative after his coming and i'm sure there will be lots of uh, things to see from uh, the potentially active atul anija not only in the region but in also connecting the puzzle that uh, most of the distinguished speaker did not put india and china in the quagmire of west asia atul please feel free and uh, the floor is yours thank you thank you so much vail and thank you and the uh, philotoma foundation for having me uh, it's a an honor and a privilege to be here with such a distinguished set of speakers and a great audience online i'm sure see um well i thought of uh, you know looking at the indian side how it is evolving um in terms of its response globally globally if you look at the big picture uh, the middle uh, the west asia itself is trying to adjust itself to a rapidly evolving multipolar world that agenda is not finished but the old order is gone you no longer have the unipolar world moment which you had after the collapse of the berlin wall in 1989 and because the american uh, 
power is on the decline. And here I agree completely with uh, Ambassador Badr Kumar. The other players which have occupied geoeconomic and geopolitical space, and the region is adjusting, I think, to four major pivots. The rise of Turkey on one side, Israel on the other side. Uh, then you have uh, Iran, which has come in a big time, uh, reasserting itself. And of course, Saudi Arabia. These are again moving parts, and the rest of us are trying to adjust to the as these particular players evolve their policies in a multipolar world, which is still a work in progress. So this this is a stage of extreme fluidity, and uh, we can only see certain strategic directions being developed, but there is no end game or or you know. We're not towards anywhere close to the end of this process. And India falls within this larger uh, dynamic of fluidity. Uh, it's so, things are changing so fast that, you know, if I look at the Indian uh, evolution of its foreign policy, uh, even a month ago, I would have said that, you know, it is the Quad which is a defining uh, sort of a dynamic driving Indian foreign policy towards what Pasha said, was these four countries. But uh, frankly, I do see with the coming of the Biden administration a change in thinking within our government. But having said that, I would, you know, being a journalist and active journalist again in the Indian system, I can see there's a big tussle still which is going on within our system. There is a section which realizes that, you know, you can't go too far with the court. And the reason for that is that Biden administration is unreliable, then finally they'll have a deal with the Chinese and we will be left high and dry. So again, we need to come back to a strategic autonomy model and rework our ties with other major global powers, especially with start, restart Russia, Central Asia, revisit Iran. So that's a very strong sentiment which is moving in, but yet there's a very strong lobby as it is. I can say it openly in this forum, since we follow Chatham House rules, that there is also a strong lobby which is trying to pull us in the direction of the Americans. But I think on balance, we are reaching a stage where there is realization of the merits of strategic, uh, strategic autonomy defined during the Vajpayee era uh, and uh, after the nuclear tests and reworking along the lines. And I think that is getting reflected with an attempt to re-engage with Iran, especially with the Chabahar port as the access not only to Iran, but towards Afghanistan and Malaysia. There's a strong sentiment coming over here. And it could to even a, a fortnight ago, when we had this so-called Chabahar Day, where the Central Affairs Minister went on to say that we need to integrate the two routes, which is the Chabahar route from Chabahar North up to Afghanistan, and the North-South Corridor, which is essentially Mumbai, Bandar Abbas, then across the Iranian mainland to Bandar Anzali on the Caspian, and then Astra Khan, and then forward into 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 other areas which the Russians have developed, which is right up to the Caucasian areas or Armenia, others, uh, Uzbekistan is in Central Asia has come back time. I think that process of wild rhetoric may be going every, anywhere else, but there is a structural change which is taking place, especially after the Suez crisis, which we had with the blocking of the canal, uh, visiting uh, an attempt to forge the structural changes and uh, also attempt to lower the security content of the cord, uh, despite all the exercises, take it more towards humanitarian areas, towards COVID vaccines, et cetera, and try and pull off that part. But still dynamic, it's not the end game, but at least personally, I'm heartened to see that revival of a Eurasian policy coming up uh, in, 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 a, in our government. Uh, so uh, I think, from the Indian point of view now, as we move closer, there's another thing why uh, Iran becomes even more important, apart from the traditional reasons of transit and energy security. There is a section within the system, not necessarily government, which is looking at Iran as a gateway to Balochistan. And that is, again, driving a section, or there is a pressure group which is on, on the government to, 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 to leverage uh, Iran's geography vis-a-vis uh, -vis Balochistan. Uh, uh, I particularly, personally, don't see the merits of the policy, but Iran becomes important as a, as a result for reasons more than one. Uh, so this is, uh, 
when you come to other spheres in the in in west asia uh, now the point would be how do you balance as you move closer towards iran because of your strategic compulsions especially with the fluidity in afghanistan how do you balance the israel iran equation and uh, the previous governments have managed to do so and drawn their own red lines how far to go with each but this is going to be a major challenge between india but you know there is a dynamic again going on within israel and one does not know the fate of the extreme right of netanyahu and others especially with the court cases starting over there uh, uh, which way uh, that will go that is internally which way israel will i think uh, very interestingly a new track which is a bilateral track between india and uh, and syria is opening up because of the situation in turkey where both countries i found a, a strategic objective to bond uh, 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 once again and i think given what's happening in the equation between turkey pakistan china malaysia i do believe that there is a strategic compulsion for us to reengage in the liwan separately uh, than before i would now like to finally come to to, to the chinese uh, you know i agree with seema and others that china is going in big time uh not only in the region but you know really trying to assert itself as a global power uh from an indian perspective while we engage with eurasia how do we how do we respond to china after all we are members with china both in the brics and with the shanghai cooperation organization but what happened in the galwan valley on june 15th uh, uh was uh, last year is is something which has impaired the india china track quite fundamentally and frankly we had the visit of lavrov recently and one of the topics which has come up is really you know what uh, ambassador bhadra kumar had hinted that russia china equation has been forged because i think mainly because the sanctions of the west which is the stupidity of the west which has got russia and 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 china in this strategic embrace but again how long will it last given the bad history of russia and china in the soviet days after two countries had fought a war on the banks of the usuri river in 1969 and the mistress is there as well so what the russians are looking at indians is uh, to put it quite bluntly is that while we engage with the chinese we don't want chinese inroads into central asia which is essentially our backyard so can india and russia work together in central asia while russia engages with china i mean these are the fine print dialogues which have started already and can india be involved in security structures uh, uh, forged by by russia in the future because while you engage the complexity is that the process of engagement and containment seems to be going simultaneously as the multipolar world comes into it there is a mistrust of china and that is uh, while i agree with pasha that it doesn't have a colonial history as the as the other parts have but you know and this is more pronounced less in west asia but definitely more in vietnam and southeast asia is the middle kingdom syndrome after all when china says that it is going to be the greatest power on earth by 2050 i'm talking about the xi jin speak uh, xi jinping speech at the 19th party congress in 2017 which i witnessed first hand that you know you have declared your road map and when you say the revival of the rejuvenation of the chinese nation what is it that you are referring to so there is a especially in southeast asia a great fear that this is essentially the middle king mentality which is you know when you are the center of the universe and surrounded by satellite states so this mistrust of china uh, though less in the middle east is definitely pronounced that in the garb of a multipolar world and a an asian century are we going to have a chinese century and is china going to replace a, a horrible hegemon like america and we have another asian hegemon which is coming and which is which which is better of the two so there is a simultaneous kind of a mistrust of china while there is also those who come from the decolonization mindset that after all we are finally having a country a civilization which is coming into its into its own and without china we can't have a multipolar world i think countries like india will have to also continue i mean there's no point in saying you can't engage with china you there's no option but to engage with china but how do you engage how do you manage it 
where which sectors you engage and where you contain or where where you hedge i think these are going to be major challenges uh, for india and you can't wish it away because china is there in the middle east and in west asia and other parts of the world sooner or later uh, there will have to be some modus vivendi probably the russians are are fully aware with it about it that it is it would be uh, you know india permanently joining the quad into a security alliance that neither the russians nor i think most indians indians want but how do you at the same time address uh, india's concerns towards china and 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 visa vice versa so they, these are going to be uh, 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 i think what the problem really is arising is that the intensive track to dialogue which was going on between india and china at one time that has got stalled at this time the chinese from a chinese perspective i can see that you know when you talk about what happened in ladakh that their real worry is accession that you know it is india which is building a road towards the karakoram pass and it exposes one of the major highways which links xinjiang and the with tibet so my final thoughts is that look at what has happened from pakistan about the loc the you know revival of the ceasefire agreement i see it as a much bigger chinese initiative because china wants to secure cpec and for that if there is a settlement between india and pakistan it will go a long way in sort of getting this flag flagship uh, project uh, moving so there is a chinese element which is coming into it i think it's part of a package and if we have as we progress to a possible dialogue the chinese are going to come and talk to us about their concern their strategy concerns about about accession i think the hope lies there in a constructive dialogue uh, which should which should continue Uh, and we manage finally to the laudable objective of getting a multipolar world finally explored thank you well i think i've said enough thank you very much you were also on time i am very happy and uh, i should compliment everybody who have been already stick to the guideline and they were on time uh, i need to open the floor for the questions we have a couple of questions from the audiences which i think munir have shared a question to all everybody can answer from our ambassador dr riyad and all of you he is asking what will be the impact of abraham accord on the regional order excellency can you start with you and then we can take one by one mm. yes uh, in the big, beginning i would like to say you the abraham agreement was born dead because not all the party agreed about the condition of this uh, treatment between israel and arab country and especially no palace uh, one uh, person uh, from palestine or any entity from palestine would like to sign on this abraham uh, treatment that is why it was born dead in the middle east and uh, uh, i would like to say that the, uh, there is no peace in middle east without uh, the legal demand of palestinian people and there is no peace in the middle east without the right of syrian people uh, uh, by control uh, if you would like to make peace by force peace for peace it will not remain in the land it, it, it is not fair for the arab countries it not fair for syrian people even for palestinian people that is why uh, abraham treatment was born dead okay. this is my uh, opinion okay thank you thank you can we have uh, uh, professor basha or uh, ambassador can you please any one of you can step in any of the distinguished speakers please my take on the abraham accord is uh, exactly uh, what i had uh, uh, written way back on the camp david accords between egypt and israel and the bilateral peace treaty i had uh, i have written my phd thesis on this bilateral peace treaty between egypt and israel uh, signed in march 1979 because my view then was uh, that uh, sadat by concluding even the bilateral agreement had uh, solved the sinai problem otherwise probably uh, we would have been still discussing about uh, sinai problem and uh, after that of course there were many problems uh, with the settlements in west bank and all but uh, we uh, move forward in 88 when the pnc accepted 242 and the oslo accord 242 uh, uh, in september 1994 so in that way abraham accords uh, 
our uh, the inevitable move towards uh, normalization and recognition of israel uh, which was there in the offing either clandestinely or uh, surreptitiously it is uh, it is good that uh, uae and bahrain and uh, sudan and morocco have come into the open uh, which many countries uh, were uh, doing secretly so in that way uh, although uh, the rulers have signed the agreement uh, i don't think they have taken the people uh, in all of these countries with them just as uh, the egyptian people still today refuse to support the full peace with israel it is still cold peace between the egyptian people and the israelis and the jordanians and the uh, israelis and the palestinians and the israelis so, so is the uh, accord abraham accord between the uh, bahrainis uae sudan uh, moroccan i don't think if there is any survey carried out public opinion there will be support to these accords so in that way what sadat did and what uh, mbz is doing or uh, the sudanese or the moroccan or bahraini rulers are doing it is uh, pressure due to the americans and the israelis uh, using the iranian threat as a cover to normalize and legitimize uh, the state of israel this will go on probably saudi arabia or oman or other countries uh, would join in the near future i see some benefits but largely it has a negative effect but it is inevitable even the new biden administration will move forward and pressurize uh, countries uh, which have not uh, recognized israel to establish diplomatic relations so the train is moving step by step from 79 and it will only pick up in the future thank you anyone else would like to add to the point yeah i think uh, you know with the abraham accords i agree with pasha that this is, seems to be inevitable though i did want to ask him uh, you know will there be a nuance added by the biden administration because after all if they are successors to to obama administration obama administration did have a particularly good relationship with israel and especially the personal chemistry between between president obama and uh, netanyahu was terrible uh, but you know in in issues like this personalities perhaps may not play that much of a important role but strategic interest would so that's that's one question i have for pasha that do you see a tweaking of uh, biden administration's policy towards towards israel i have to make one brief comment and that is uh, you know with the abraham accords and it's also interesting that simultaneously the jcpoa poa that is the iran nuclear deal is also getting uh, sort of a second lease we can see signs of that coming which would mean better relationship between iran and the west so how would that you know coming of entrenching of israel in the gulf and simultaneously improvement of relations between the west and iran how would that equation impact on the israel iran relationship or will it have no impact these are my more of my sort of you know thinking aloud and if, if dr pasha can share yeah, some I, I i will take i will take dr basha but let me have the view of ambassador bhadra kumar yeah. because i believe he also Mm -hmm. uh, have a point to make he has wrote here about this issue uh, extensively uh, yes uh, ambassador can we have your point of view please uh, yes uh, well you know uh, uh, two three things you know one is this that uh, i am of the firm belief that uh, west asia is in the cusp of change and uh, all these uh, happenings were taking place in a certain type of uh, political strategic environment there now that is coming apart quite evidently for a variety of reasons china iran nuclear deal united states is diminishing influence and all that i tend to see that uh, there is really no popular acceptance of abraham deals in the region okay and uh, in a in a regional environment where uh, you know the uh, opinion of the people will matter i think this is going to be a liability for a number of arab regimes which have uh, entered into it sudan is a good example actually money changed hands for uh, sudan to come into it you pick up an individual and you influence him in a transitional setup a military man pay him money and you get him his country and it's not a representative government at all you know to uh, recognize israel that is what abraham accord says 
And as far as the UAE is concerned, UAE has been involved in a certain trajectory of power projection in various parts of the world. And this, uh, uh, this uh, trip with Israel is uh, directed also largely against Turkey. So, you know, uh, there, uh, there is even uh, a limited convergence, even only between UAE and uh, Israel in terms of the objectives they are pursuing. I don't know to what extent Israel is interested in projection of power into Libya, for example. So in uh, Yemen, yes, in terms of controlling the waters of the Red Sea and so on, there is a congruence. So it's a geopolitical congruence between UAE and uh, Israel. There is no meeting of minds. And again, there is no evidence that the Sheikhs uh, ascertained the popular opinion in their countries, you know, before, before they ventured into this. Above all, uh, we need to understand this, that uh, uh, this Abraham Accords is the product of not even uh, Trump. I don't think he's a thinking type. I don't think he was behind it. It is Kushner's project, who's a yeah. closer rabbi. And, you know, he pushed, put it together, this Abraham Accords. Now, when you come to Biden administration, no uh, American president will say that, you know, that he doesn't like what has happened because the uh, United States certainly has been promoting as a longstanding policy uh, a rapprochement between Israel and the Arab world. Therefore, they uh, opinionate on it. But I don't know if you are aware of it, that yesterday uh, they uh, announced, the State Department announced, in fact, the resumption of aid to the Palestinians, you know? And yeah. the amount that uh, they are starting with an amount of $235 million. And in that announcement of the State Department, towards the end, it is mentioned also that this will help advance the two-state uh, solution. So in other yeah. words, uh, there is a major shift in the American thinking in regard of uh, you know, the Palestinian problem. And how they push it, to what extent they push it, I'm not trying to say that they'll be able to shove this down the Israeli throat. Yeah because this administration is also having a problem, a serious domestic crisis in America. And there is the congressional opinion. They have to take into account where the Israeli lobby is very active. Therefore, but within these limitations, the thinking there, then again, you see the staffing pattern, the National Security Council staffing pattern. Palestinians are there in a big way for the first time in the American national security establishment. Let me put it like this, including the director who is in charge of uh, Middle East, in the National okay. Security Council is a Palestinian, you know? Yeah. So, you know, uh, there are nuances in the situation. Then you see, yeah. above all, uh, Seema mentioned this, that I had circulated this uh, Russian-Chinese uh, um, statement on global governance. Yeah. Above all, there is, the, there, is the, uh, there is the new ideas that are being brought onto the regional plate. Now, uh, as far as China is concerned, you see, you go through the Wangli visit and you go through this document with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the Russians on global governance. How does it apply to the West Asian situation? How does it apply? The, its principal elements are, I just jotted down while listening to the discussion here. One is that uh, there has to be uh, global governance uh, uh, respecting international law. And it specifically mentions about the primacy of the United Nations Security Council. That is number one. And okay. both Russia and uh, China continue to affirm their support for the Palestinian problem. Okay. You, you, you see that. And the second one is equal relationships with uh, all states. You know, that is it. And Wang Yi went to sign this pact with his, his Iran, but he embedded Iran in a regional itinerary. It conveys a huge message. He started actually with Saudi Arabia, where the Saudi Crown Prince resoundingly voiced support for China on the Uyghur issue and on Hong Kong. And from there, he went to uh, Turkey, and then he landed in Tehran. So you see, the uh, and the Russian attitude is the same. Lavrov just visited, in fact, the Gulf region. Lavrov has good equations with the, and he's, Lavrov is going to Tehran on the 14th. And they have good equations with all sides. And in Syria, they have excellent relationships. So, you know, they are, China and Russia are moving, as far as I can see, on parallel tracks. And in this one, what they are doing is they are creating space for the Arab countries. 
to negotiate better, more effectively with the West. I would like to invite the people to listen to Professor, uh, to Ambassador Patra Kumar and visit his uh, website and his blockers as the punchlines to read more because I wanted to give the floor to the rest of the panelists. Thank yes, you, just, Ambassador. Just one minute. Uh, I think uh, the issue raised by Atul Eneja has been partly uh, answered by Ambassador Badr Kumar. I just like to underline two points. One is uh, uh, the Biden administration is not going to revisit the Abraham Accords. In fact, my view is that they would reinforce and uh, uh, bring in other countries in a very different way diplomatically compared to what Donald Trump uh, did. Uh, the two signs I see is uh, Secretary of State Blinken has uh, recently said that uh, what the Israelis should be thinking uh, of uh, in the coming months and years is the uh, giving of same rights and privileges to the Palestinians as they enjoy. So he said, uh, until unless the Israelis treat and uh, respect the Palestinian rights, there won't be legitimacy for the state of Israel. This is one. Number two, uh, the State Department has already started referring to the West Bank as occupied territory, which is very different from what uh, Donald Trump uh, had been saying for the last uh, four years. So there is this subtle shift because there was this... Uh, uh, this um, this uh, deal of the century hit the wall uh, when uh, Kushner used to expect that all the Arab countries, including Palestinians, would support. That was not the case. Even Saudi Arabia uh, was uh, uh, mentioned that it is very close to establishing diplomatic relations and that it will give, be given some cover or Jerusalem and uh, uh, what is happening in Jordan is linked to uh, the real ambitions of uh, Saudi Arabia to have some say in the uh, Jerusalem Holy Mosque and uh, Bait al-Muqaddas. So in that way, the Americans also have realized that until unless uh, the state solution is visited and vigorously supported by the United States, whether it is in the United Nations or even uh, through pressure on Israel, there is no, there will not be many takers in the Arab world, however much pressure the Americans and the Israelis might uh, impose. Even countries like Indonesia or uh, Pakistan or uh, other countries, uh, Algeria or uh, different Arab countries are far from uh, being very close to what the Israelis want, like the Arab Abraham Accord. So in that way, the Americans uh, within the United States itself, uh, because of the uh, growing uh, pressure and support for the Palestinian cause and the, in the European Union also. You see, all the uh, efforts by the Quartet, Tony Blair to uh, the Americans, uh, Annapolis, uh, and all the accords uh, have not taken very far. It, they have been just tinkering with the uh, solution. So in that way, the I got your point. solution got is your point. a viable option. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, America may come back to its traditional way of dealing with the Middle East. may not be a priority, but could be also a way forward that America coming back into their own follow-up in the region of two-state solution still be a mirage. But I have another question from Dr. Abdul Wajid. Uh, Abdul Wajid, he is also asking about the uh, India future uh, relation with West Asian countries, especially the GCC. And I'd like to add one point here. Also, the the sanctions policy, which is followed by the American on the regions, have they caused disastrous, especially to Syria and Iraq, Iran. Ambassador Riyadh, would you like to comment on this India rules and India interest? Thank you, Dr. Uh, Awad. But please, before that, I would like to ask our friendly country, and especially India, and our allies and all countries in the world to help Syria to lift the sanction on Syria. And we request also a uh, friendly, friendly country to uh, reopen their embassy in Damascus. And okay. uh, uh, before also uh, answer you, I would like to uh, tell you what is the challenge, challenges uh, for the peace in Middle East. One and most important, how to solve the Arab-Israeli conflict. Number two, water problem and increasing uh, population. Uh, three, the uh, rising tide of uh, fundamentalism and uh, terrorism. Four, armament 
and weapons of mass uh, destruction. That is the uh, challenges for the peace in Middle East. For the rule in India, as we, uh, we know, and uh, India uh, has balanced policy, foreigner, policy, uh, for, uh, foreigner uh, balanced policy in the world. And any order took by Indian government, all uh, friendly country will, will follow. India has good policy with Arab world since the independent of uh, mm. India. And we look forward to take a measure and strong decision and to make a positive uh, advance step uh, in Arab country and especially in Syria, because we trust the Indian policy and uh, we know uh, India has good uh, relation with the GCC country because of power and there is big community, uh, Indian community in GCC country. From our side in Syria, we're looking forward to enhance the relation with India and we are uh, the richest country in the Middle East right now. That is why superpower country conflict uh, on Syria. Uh, we can uh, share all our national uh, resources, our wealth with India, and we look forward to enhance the relation with our friendly country. And uh, from our side, we look forward to see the peace between uh, India and the neighboring country, especially this problem which happened in the uh, border. And uh, we are in favor of India always to make uh, this settlement according to all between India and other country themselves, no uh, any external intervention. Thank you, my friend. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ambassador. I think Atul, you can step in because you live in the Gulf. You Can you put the India uh, interest and the future of India with the GCC at least? Please? And then I follow with Professor Pasha on this. And yeah. uh, well, I think India is going to balance between the GCC and Iran. Iran, because of Afghanistan, and that's a national security issue comes into play. We don't want a 1988 kind of situation. And that you know becomes a base for launching of, of terror. Therefore, national security will drive us to Iran. Simultaneously, the engagement with the, the GCC country has to be there for various reasons. As the COVID situation eases, I think India would want its guest workers to get back into GCC countries urgently, more importantly, because of the billions of dollars of remittances we get from that region. Energy okay. security is another. So they're enduring. Uh, binding factors which will drive India towards towards the GCC, uh, including Saudi Arabia. But I think what is going to happen here is now in the stage we are, and as the as the nuclear deal with Iran starts, the dialogue on that starts, that India will will be driven to you know drive this balance between Iran and Saudi Arabia. I think that's likely to happen uh, as we sort of look into the next few months. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. So, Ambassador uh, Bhadra Kumar, would you like to add anything on this? Actually, candidly, uh, India uh, needs just the regional power dynamic. Uh, in the most recent years, I think that is uh, the crux of the matter. And a course correction will be needed. Uh, the assumption that, you know, that the region is going to be permanently frozen in a rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran was actually unwarranted. And uh, there were enough signs in the air to show that the ground is shifting beneath the feet. And uh, okay. two, uh, I think the policy was uh, overwhelmingly predicated on an axis with Israel. Now that is again, was uh, unrealistic and it was unnecessary uh, because a uh, number of countries, you know, tended to look at India as uh, the, this side, the eastern end of an axis with Israel. That is not necessarily it's a liability for Indian policy because you know, there's a lot of goodwill in the region towards India. And uh, from what we have seen already, I think a number of speakers have acknowledged this, that uh, the uh, Iran problem is going to be solved also within a certain regional matrix. And in that regional matrix, there is a, a, going to be an attempt to harmonize the relationships within one regional security architecture. Israel okay. will remain an outsider. And okay. this United States has uh, uh, moved towards subtle moves towards uh, rekindling the Palestinian issue, bringing back okay. on the table the two state resolution and uh, so on. 
Russians voicing support for it, China voicing support for it. And do not forget, there is a very strong body of opinion in Europe, in the European Union, affirming this, that Israel has to listen to the Palestinian problem and has okay. to attend to it. And Israel's trump card so far was that it could distract attention by turning everyone toward the Iran nuclear issue. That's not going to be possible uh, very soon. So you okay. see, all these things taken into account, India must really look at this as an extended region, uh, but not really as a, as, a, as a region where India is a co-partner of Israel or United States or anybody. Because India lives in its region, and we have you know, millions of people living in that region. And uh, yeah. democracy comes or not, everyone has goodwill towards India. So why should we have forfeited it? I am frankly, let me put it this way, I am very sad and depressed at this miscalculation that we have made in the most recent years. But we must come back very soon because the phenomenal change taking place in the region, will otherwise we'll see that we are left in the station and the train moves away. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Yes, um, Professor Pasha, please. The first point I would like to highlight is, you see, it was unnecessary on India's part to accept the U.S. sanctions on Iran uh, whole hog. You know, we should have found ways and means uh, uh, to keep our contacts, whether it is oil imports or trade or uh, various other things which were ongoing with Iran. Uh, that, I think, was self-inflicted harm. The second one is... Uh, you see the identification with the UAE and what uh, UAE was doing in Syria and Yemen and uh, Libya and all, you know, that has sent a wrong message that uh, India's identification with one state and its uh, UAE's regional amb ambitions uh, was not fair on our uh, part. The third reason is, of course, we, uh, Prime Minister Modi visited Qatar, Saudi Arabia and other countries. But uh, if you see the social media in the GCC countries, what is happening within India, uh, the domestic situation, you know, the deviation from pluralism, uh, the attacks on minorities and uh, various other things, right wing agenda of the groups, uh, you know, that has also tarnished uh, the image of India as a secular democratic country in this uh, region. You know, it is not uh, enough that uh, Prime Minister Modi gets awards, civilian awards, highest awards from Bahrain or UAE or Saudi Arabia. But it is the people uh, in this region, uh, what they think about uh, what shape in, uh, and what direction in which uh, India is going. So uh, the, the, the identification with the UAE and its uh, interventionist agenda, I think, uh, has harmed India's interest. We need to balance uh, between uh, Iran and the GCC countries because within GCC, what do we have? Uh, the uh, Kuwaitis and uh, the Omanis are just, uh, uh, you know, not happy with what uh, we are doing with the UAE and the Saudi. The Saudis, of course, now we have a spat on the oil uh, issue, and uh, Pakistan will obviously try to take advantage. In, fa in fact, the Saudis uh, MBS uh, is now uh, thinking that if he doesn't get 100% support from the Biden administration and if the human rights issue is going to be a big factor, they will go back to the alliance which they had with Pakistan because they see neither Turkey nor Egypt coming to its aid in, uh, in a, a crisis situation. Only Pakistani army, they feel it will come to its rescue for uh, regime uh, support. So again, we are back to square one where the Saudis are looking to Pakistan and Pakistan is trying to uh, undermine Indian interest if we don't uh, follow a foresighted policy and then succumb to American or Israeli pressure in this region. Thank you. Seema, I will ask you to answer this question because there are a couple of questions I'm going to read. And there is another question from uh, our uh, Rashid Choudhury, who is also asking about the role of the United States to react to it and the China role in the West Asia increase tremendously. So what will be the future of U.S. involvement in West Asia? If anybody would like to add what, what we have already talked about. And the other question also was about the Ambassador Bhadra Kumar. Can you summarize, the, the uh, can you enumerate reasons about the road blocks of India being part of BRI? Is it deliberate on the part of China to keep India out of the loop or US, or U.S. has some role in the reluctance from India's side 
in this region. So I, these are the questions has been raised. And I would like everybody to start the answer. If Seema, you are still there, please feel free to start with you and then I open the floor. But I think um, the question to Ambassador Bhadra Kumar is, uh, uh, it's very clear that I think uh, the Americans have a major role and have played a major role in keeping India out of the Chinese uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and uh, this also comes in uh, as us being part of the Quad and our, us taking a very clear position against the expansionism or the growth of China, not just in the region, but across the world. Uh, the US strategy is not going to be just West Asia. It's going, it is already a strategy that is in motion to control the spread of China's influence across the world. And it is being done right from Southeast Asia across the world. So, uh, and the West Asia role is, will, you know, uh, will obviously feed into the larger policy. Uh, the, 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 the competition and the adversity between the United States and China is very, very obvious. And countries are under pressure to take sides in what is becoming a polarized and has been a polarized uh, kind of a, a competition. Uh, the only thing is, as has been pointed out by everyone, is that the United States in the world. And the United States itself is not a growing but a reducing power, whereas China is a growing and not, uh, growing power. So how this marries itself and how this plays across the world is something which is of great interest and we will see as we move along. Yes, Professor Pasha. And then I'll take Bhadra Kumar. Yes, I think Americans are doing their best uh, uh, to restrict uh, China in this part of the region as they have been doing elsewhere. But uh, you see the, the train has left the station whether it is uh, Hong Kong or uh, Beijing, it is on the move. There is no power on earth uh, which can stop the Chinese from uh, uh, effectively implementing the BRI from uh, Turkmenistan to Afghanistan to Turkey, Iran, and almost all countries. I don't see any country uh, except in some parts Sri Lanka listening to India. Uh, in Southeast Asia also, uh, they are uh, worried about China, but still they would like to have trade uh, and commerce with uh, China, whether it is Vietnam or Laos or Cambodia or Burma or Indonesia or Malaysia. And beyond that, from Italy to Germany to Russia to Kazakhstan and the maritime uh, Silk Route uh, linking Egypt and uh, East Africa, almost all countries, more than 140 countries have... Uh, now supported the BRI project. I don't think the Americans have much uh, headway, made head, uh, much headway, and uh, their link up with India also has not cut much ice. So in that way, the Chinese train is unstoppable, uh, simply because they have the money, they have the drive, they have the initiative, they have the motivation, and they, have, they are consistent in their approach. And what all these countries in Eurasia and Africa also need is the infrastructure which the West has promised, both EU and America, and which they did not uh, succeed in building up, whether it is hospitals or schools or roads or railways or ports or just the IT sector. The Chinese are uh, full swing working and promising and delivering on time. And uh, you can see the infrastructure uh, being built up by the Chinese uh, everywhere. And uh, the, the Iranians are the latest to join. And uh, the losers are uh, India and uh, the United States uh, in Iran. You know, Russia, China, Iran, and Turkey, if, if they get together, they can reshape the regional order in the Gulf region, if not beyond in West Asia. So in that way, Chinese BRI project uh, is... Uh, marching ahead and I have no doubt about uh, its ultimate success. The Chinese, of course, uh, will be, uh, will, the Americans will try to constrain them, but uh, where is the where is the American uh, money coming into the picture? Uh, are they willing to give the kind of money and uh, in the infrastructure which the Chinese are uh, building? I don't see the will determination of the EU or the Americans to pour in that kind of money given the pandemic and the economic situation which the America has locked itself in. 
Okay, thank you very much. I can ask uh, uh, Ambassador Bhadrakumar. Uh, you know, the, uh, well, the, 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 the contracts, contrasts, you know, couldn't be sharper than this, that um, offering the West Asian countries a relationship based on equality, that is an equal relationship where there is no interference in the internal affairs of the countries of the region. Can the United States compete with it? It cannot. Do not use human rights as a handle to interfere in the internal affairs of uh, the regional states. Can the United States compete with that? It cannot. You see, I don't think it is just the BRI. BRI, let us see, BRI is an instrumentality. It's an instrumentality for uh, uh, spreading the influence in the region. And uh, uh, Professor Pasha was very right that, you know, at the end of the day, uh, can the Americans match China in putting money on the table? I don't think so. You know, this uh, trillion, multi-trillion dollar package for the reviving the American economy is means, you know, that they are bogged down for the next one decade in at home. And this is not a time that they can compete with this. And this is the problem, even in Southeast Asia with the ASEAN countries, this is the same problem. So China offers something interesting. Now, look at this the way they are able to diversify the relationship. They have made UAE the hub for local production of the vaccine to be exported and distributed to the whole African continent. For that, they identified there because of the business culture, because of the UAE people's capacity to handle this sort of an enterprise. Before Wang Yi arrived in Saudi Arabia, the CEO of Aramco, he says that United, that Saudi Arabia is committed to China as the most important uh, market for oil, their oil for the next 50 year period. Snubbed India, as you know, this is, this is after one week after snubbing India that he has said this. And look at the way the uh, Crown Prince warmed up to Wang Yi. And you know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's really stunning that he stood up and he said, that with all the prestige at their command in the Muslim world, they will not be party to what the United States is doing in terms of breaking up the Uyghur problem. Is there any other issue which matters more to China than this? So you see, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a win-win cooperation that is uh, shaping up there. I can't see possibly the United States cannot match it. Now, let me put this one, Will, you know, before we didn't touch on this, what the Americans are trying to do is to bring in Turkey now. That is by exploiting the tensions between Turkey and uh, Iran, uh, using this Al-Qaeda presence in uh, Idlib province, there's a congruence between Turkey and the United States because both are patronizing the same Al-Qaeda group. And now the Americans have brought in Turkey into the Afghan situation as a peacemaker. The idea being that Turkey can be made to play a certain type of role in Xinjiang, Central Asia, and Russia's Caucasus. Turkey's relationship with uh, Russia is rocky already. With, with Iran, it is chilling. And uh, you know there is friction even in Ira over Iraq. And with China, there is big change in the Turkish rhetoric in the last four or five days. So you see, what the United States has offered Turkey is not in the public domain still. We will know by and by, nothing remains secret in that region for long. So they are turning into a different uh, approach towards it, you know, for, because ultimately it will be the Cold War strategy to pit China against Islam. Thank you. I think you made your point very interesting, very interesting. I think Atul, but I... Yeah, thank you, El. You know, regarding China-US equation, I'm absolutely convinced that there is going to be a grand bargain between the two very soon. It would not have taken place under Trump administration because that was ideologically driven. It had the collapse of the CPC as a declared goal. Whereas Biden is looking for a grand of, of, of accommodation with China where US gets a good deal out of it. It's a matter of time when they bond. You look at the US financial interests in China. I mean, they're enormous. Wall Street is heavily invested in, in China. You have Apple, you have all the big the, the car manufacturers. The biggest market for them is China and there is no alternative. 
is just a matter of time. Universities, Chinghua University, you know, Blackstone Foundation. I mean, the amount of uh, integration between China and the U.S., which took place since Deng Xiaoping's time, is for me was such an eye opener. Once I once I went to that place, that's going to happen. And the Chinese are already talking about not G8 or G7. They are talking of a G2, that we and the Americans. So I do not agree with this assumption that we are entering a Cold War era. The situation has changed. Had Trump won again, yes, we were moving in that trajectory. Now we are heading in the direction of a grand bargain between the U.S. and the Chinese. That is number one. Number two, well, I have uh, you know some concern. While we talk about the benefits in Iran and other places, nuclear deal with the Biden administration coming, but I'm afraid the Levant is going to be a problem. Like in the Obama years, you're going to have the revival of Jabhat al-Nusra kinds, the terror groups. I mean, I I did my journalism in Benghazi and other places and saw McCain come over there, and in the kind of integration which the Obama administration had with terror groups through Turkey and Adana as their base and infiltration into Deir el-Zur and other areas. I fear that we, are, we may revisit that kind of a situation where the Russians will again have to be, play a very strong role for the Syrians. That's a big negative that is likely to come with the arrival of the Biden administration. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I take the final question for myself. I'm saving the last question for myself. And the question is very, uh, I mean, articulated. Maybe we can provoke the audience and researchers and students who are watching us to analyze and to go forward with the input of our distinguished guests. The old era of uh, occupation, colonizations, and wars, traditional wars have changed. Now with the cyber technology, with the IT revolution, you can start it from a war zone, from a, you know, sitting in California, you can start a war anywhere. You can start it with just the rest of a button. So how do we see the emergence of West Asia with the new development? We have not talked of the Beirut blast of the port. We have not talked of the attacking of the ships in the Mediterranean or in, inside the Red Sea between Israel and the, the, the shadow war between Israel and Iran. We have not spoken of the Bab al-Mandib and, and Hormuz uh, Strait. Where do we see uh, where are we heading? I'm leaving this question open, and it's just a, a, a 30 second of each. Let us provoke, incite our friends and everybody to go and really talk about this, because these are the future. This is the future war where we are going to see the conflict of interest taking different direction, because here we are, the scarcities of the, scarcity of the natural resources are driving the world and the great powers into this uh, uh, big, big games of the West Asian uh, uh, you know, wealth and oil. As well. Please feel free to answer everyone. Uh, Professor Pasha? Yes, just one um, point. You see whether it is the Turkish Straits, uh, which are crucial for the Russians, or the Straits of Gibraltar for the British, uh, or the Suez Canal for all the stakeholders, or the Babul Mandab, or the Straits of Hormuz. See, these are all choke points, like the Straits, uh, Malacca Straits uh, for the Chinese. It's so, so important lifeline. These choke points will remain, and uh, they remain in control of the respective countries, uh, which we see now. But you have other ambitious regional powers, whether it is UAE trying to position itself in Djibouti or Somalia or Yemen. Uh, they try to poke their nose and they get bitten, uh, just as uh, Israel has been trying to work on an alternative Suez Canal for decades, supported by the Americans. And uh, the Turkish Straits, uh, the, uh, the French tried, and the uh, Ukrainians also were encouraged. Nothing happened. It remains firmly in the control of the Turks. So the, uh, the Straits of Hormuz also, it is, there's no doubt Iran will remain the dominant power. You see, if you uh, see the island of Hormuz and the Bandar Abbas port, you know, all the ships have to pass through within the gaze of the Iranians. Because on the other side of the shore, uh, Gulf of Oman, it is rocky. Uh, been beneath the sea, and uh, there is no way the Iranians uh, can be just uh, made to listen uh, by the Israelis or the Americans, even if they send their submarines. So in that way, all these respective countries will remain firm, firmly under control, and uh, Iran would play a dominant role uh, what goes and comes in through the state of Hormuz. And the Yemenis, uh, like the Somalis, also will try to fire and sabotage uh, uh, if they are deprived. And the Egyptians also, I don't think, will allow any alternative, although there is a 
uh, attempt through Ilat to ship uh, oil uh, to the Mediterranean through the Israeli territory. So all of these things have been talked about. These uh, core uh, yeah. uh, choke points will remain under their control, but uh, in one way or the other, uh, one great power or regional power will try to intervene, but they will not succeed. Thank you. I'm going to make sure is this, that you know that uh, however much the Biden administration is uh, prepared to accommodate uh, China's aspirations, there is going to be a gap still in the sense that, you know, from the Chinese rhetoric, I see that China will not settle for a subaltern role in that relationship. And I don't see also that the Americans will ever concede for themselves a number two position in the world hierarchy. And that is why I began at the, and the, right at the beginning, I said that, you know, that this uh, struggle is uh, going to be, for the world order, is going to be uh, fought primarily in the West Asian region. I will explain to you why. The concept of the resistance economy is already there in the, Mid in the Middle East in terms of Iran's position. And uh, we are underestimating the importance of the region from the perspective of petrodollars which is this, that, uh, you know, the, unless the United States' dollar is accepted as a world currency, they don't have the means to print notes and live beyond their means, as they have been doing. It's as simple as that. And now the point is, that is not possible if commodity trade is no longer taking and place in U.S. dollars. A, no and battery. commodity trade, China is going to make sure, is no longer going to be in traded. It may okay, be in think... yuan. It may be any other currency. So that is actually what is unfolding in West Asia. Okay. And what China is introducing is a very different proxy war. And when that comes there and the uh, privacy of the dollar is questioned, it's a solid pillar of the Western banking system. So, you know, the challenge is enormous and the Americans will have to really think that uh, a time has come to concede down to China. Okay, thank so you. I just, so long as we, have, we are in the hydrocarbon age, uh, we are going to have West Asia and North Africa as a, as a as a zone of conflict. Only when we move into a different kind of economy, when instead of oil and gas, we run after lithium or our car batteries and, and your computer laptops and as a major energy source, you know, this region is going to get, heave some sense of relief. Uh, right now, I agree with the other panelists that you, apart from the US and the ex-colonial powers like the French, New players are going to enter the Indian Ocean region, including China, and please don't forget India. The Indian Navy's build-up is, is not something which has which is not getting its due weightage in the in the media limelight. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I think uh, with, with all of you on the panel, I have learned a lot today. His Excellency Ambassador, are you there? In the end, I would like to say that America is interested for the bounties and the wealth of Arab country and Syria. That is my last word. Thank you for all. Thank you for all audience and contributions. Thank you, Dr. Basha, Badra Kumar, and uh, my friend, uh, all my friends. We'll see you soon. All the best for you and your country. Thank you. Thank you, actually. Thank, Thank you. you very much.